Good morning, everyone. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good morning, um, wherever you are. Um, welcome to the uh, Asian Impact um, a webinar series that uh, showcases the um, uh, ADB research um, and informed discussion on the critical policy issues uh, in, in Asia. I'm Yotin Jinjarak, uh, Senior Economist in the Research Department of uh, the ADB. But today's topic is the um, entrepreneurial resilience uh, during the COVID-19. For the past two years, um, uh, we uh, witnessed um, small businesses and uh, entrepreneurs uh, adapting to the challenging environment. Uh, there were local startups uh, in Asia, uh, together with universities, for example, um, that used digital technology to help uh, the few hospitals and uh, vaccination campaign uh, during the, the COVID-19 crisis. And um, elsewhere, there are many inspiring examples of say um, uh, entrepreneurs uh, using uh, digitalization to improve uh, the resilience of their businesses. Um, example of uh, entrepreneurs taking on a social mission uh, to mitigate the pandemic crisis. And uh, even government engaging with uh, entrepreneurs the, uh, to enhance the public services. So what, what, what have we learned uh, about uh, how the pandemic crisis uh, reshape uh, the business environment um, and how study the responses of entrepreneurs uh, in Asia and elsewhere? Um, and how entrepreneur, entrepreneurial firms are becoming the, uh, important drivers uh, of uh, economic resilience uh, during the crisis. Um, so uh, today uh, we are fortunate uh, to have uh, a panel of uh, distinguished uh, experts uh, to provide their insights uh, uh, from the few works on entrepreneurship uh, across several economies. And uh, our discussion today uh, will be evidence-based uh, exploration uh, on the entrepreneurship, uh, which uh, continues to um, transform the economic landscape in, in Asia. So the expert will share their insights uh, from uh, a two-year panel study um, uh, in the four Asian countries, as well as the United Kingdom, uh, to illuminate uh, on how entrepreneurs have built uh, resilience uh, in their business. Uh, we will start with a, a brief uh, presentation uh, to understand the key elements, uh, then followed by a panel discussion. Uh, for the presentation, uh, I would like to welcome uh, Professor Ergo Altio, uh, professor in the Technology, Venturing and Entrepreneurship from the Imperial College Business School in London. Uh, professor Alto, uh, please, the, the floor is yours. Um, thank you. I hope you can see my um, slide. So um, thank you very much for inviting me to this workshop. Um, over the past year and a half, Together with Asian Development Bank, we have been conducting longitudinal research at how entrepreneurs in Philippines, Malaysia, Thailand, China, and the UK have been coping with the COVID-19 crisis, and, and also trying to understand the implications um, uh, of, of entrepreneurial resilience for policy and practice. So let me briefly share details of our research and emerging insights. So this project was carried out as a collaboration between the Imperial College Business School, Asian Development Bank, De La Salle University in Manila, Mahidol University College of Management in Bangkok, Wuhan University, UN um, Economic and Social Council for Asia Pacific, and Malaysia's Global Innovation Center Magic. So we had two missions. Our knowledge mission was to understand how entrepreneurs develop resilient responses to economic shocks. Um, few people understand that entrepreneurial firms are an important enabler of wider economic resilience. There's solid evidence that entrepreneurs are much, much less likely than large businesses to let their employees go when the times get tough, whereas large businesses much more readily cut their workforce um, during a crisis situation. Entrepreneurs also excel at finding opportunity during the crisis, and they are also an um, important element that enhances the resilience of their regional communities. Our practice mission was to develop insights for entrepreneurs, governments, and academia on how to enhance and harness the resilient 
properties of entrepreneurial businesses for greater firm and community level resilience. So in practice, we selected over 50 entrepreneurial businesses from these five countries, and we shadowed them during the COVID-19 pandemic. And this enabled us to develop a longitudinal understanding of the enablers and mechanisms of entrepreneurial resilience before, during, and after the crisis. We conducted the interviews over the period of one year and developed an extensive data set that we are currently still analyzing. Here is our integrative framework of entrepreneurial resilience. For background thus far, organizational and not entrepreneurial resilience has been portrayed as a static ability, that is an ability to withstand and endure the onslaught of the external crisis. We survive the crisis and then we continue as before. Where entrepreneurial resilience has been studied, it has usually focused on the resilience of the entrepreneur after his or her business has failed. What has been missing is a dynamic opportunity seeking portrayal of resilience in the face of an external shock. And this is what we seek to study. This is a complex framework, so I will not go into, into detail. At the high level, our framework distinguishes between three stages, before, during, and after the crisis, with our focus being on resilience, enablers, mechanisms, and outcomes. And we also look at three levels of analysis, namely the entrepreneur or individual, their business, and the communities they operate in. So here is what we found. This is how entrepreneurs react to an external crisis. And these were kind of a, almost across the board observations in the five countries. First, we found that the COVID-19 crisis triggered an unprecedented wave of business model experimentation in entrepreneurial businesses as the pandemic challenged their current business models. Within this experimentation lies a great source of opportunity for innovation and the discovery of the post-crisis new normal. Second, we saw entrepreneurs adapt digital technologies to make their business models more adaptable, robust, and scalable. The COVID-19 really speeded up digitalization, and entrepreneurs in particular were leading the way. Third, we saw how the crisis prompted many entrepreneurs to take on social missions and to contribute to their communities in different ways to help ease the adversity caused by this common global threat. Entrepreneurs took an active role to help their communities in the face of a shared threat. Fourth, we saw many entrepreneurs actively working to contribute to the uh, uh, con convert the crisis into an opportunity. Not all entrepreneurs did so, however. Some also became passive and could not adopt a um, proactive attitude. And finally, we saw entrepreneurs joining their forces with other entrepreneurs within the entrepreneurial ecosystem community to create a buffer against the economic shock and share insight into how to mitigate its impact. The lesson here is that entrepreneurial ecosystems are really important facilitators of entrepreneurial resilience and, and governments will be well advised to nurture and facilitate these communities. Here is how we found the entrepreneurial resilience process working. First, we have the disruption, which prompts entrepreneurs to adjust to the adversity. We saw different kinds of reactions, the most important of which were improvisation, experimentation, and digitalization, as already noted. Through these modifications, many entrepreneurs discovered new opportunities opened up during the crisis, such as home delivery of food by restaurants, for example. External enablers of these adjustments were the entrepreneurial ecosystem community and the entrepreneur's social community. And internal enablers included the entrepreneur's resources and notably their social and digital capital. Experimentation and improvisation resulted in pivots as the entrepreneurs modified their business models and adopted new ones. And these then gave rise to longer term impacts both at firm and community levels. So let's go to the implications for policy and practice. First, it is important for uh, governments to recognize that the important role that entrepreneurs play as resilience enablers within the economy and, and their regional communities. Very important. Um, to facilitate this role, 
government should support SME digitalization by enhancing the accessibility and openness of digital infrastructures in their countries and, and working to bridge the digital divide in order to ensure widespread access by SMEs to digital infrastructures because digitalization is a key enabler of business model resilience. And governments would also be well advised to support business model organ reorganization process during the crisis. And uh, um, UK provides a good example of funding such projects such, such that small and medium-sized businesses could adjust to the crisis. Entrepreneur, uh, governments would be well advised to actively, proactively engage entrepreneurs to rethink public service provision during epidemics. And we have a great example from Thailand that I will highlight next and that Jotin also mentioned. Governments should nurture regional entrepreneurial ecosystem communities because these are important enablers of resilient re responses by individual entrepreneurs because they share knowledge and entrepreneurs actively help one another to help each other adjust. And finally, government should engage entrepreneurs for social mission delivery during crisis because we saw entrepreneurs actively take on social missions in reaction to the crisis. So here is the example from Thailand when the COVID-19 pandemic hit, um, the Thai government engaged digital entrepreneurs to rethink the delivery of healthcare services. So what happened was the government engaged several digital entrepreneurs. And this is um, one example was at Shulalongko University Build Hospital um, to help them rethink how they can draw on digital technologies to reduce the physical flow of patients to the healthcare system in order to better um, comply with um, social distancing uh, requirements. So the entrepreneurs started projects with which the hospitals were better able to predict and manage their capacity utilization and reduce the time individual patients had to spend in waiting rooms, for example. So here we have a great example where government engages digital entrepreneurs to make uh, the provision of public healthcare service and enhance their resilience during a crisis situation. Now, finally, insights for entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs should when a crisis hits, entrepreneurs shouldn't simply stand still. They should actively look for opportunities during the crisis. They should challenge their assumptions. They should take a fresh look at their own business. What, what is the business you are essentially in? A restaurant, for example, can take on food delivery services in order to mitigate the impact of the crisis. Entrepreneurs should invest in digital technologies because digital technologies are easier to adjust in a crisis, crisis situation. They should use the downtime productively to implement business development projects and maybe speed up uh, digital technology adoption. They should actively support their communities, local communities, and they should not try and write the crisis out alone, they should actively connect with their entrepreneurial ecosystem communities because that's where you can find help and support. That was all, Jotin, back to you. Thanks, uh, Professor Aldeo. Um, Thanks for a very comprehensive uh, presentation on the key issues and also the, uh, the, the inspiring uh, example. Um, now let's hear more from uh, the panelists. Um, now for the panel discussion, let me uh, bring in uh, our panelists. Uh, uh, first, uh, Dr. Onya Idogo, uh, a lecturer from uh, the Institute for Global Propensity uh, Prosperity uh, at the uh, University College London. Uh, welcome uh, Onya. Uh, second, uh, Professor uh, Raymond Habaradas, uh, a chair professor in entrepreneurship uh, 
from the Department of Management and Organization at the De La Salle University in the Philippines. Uh, welcome, uh, Raymond. Uh, third, uh, Mr. Yuki Yuan, uh, a doctoral candidate from the Imperial uh, College uh, Business School in London. Um, welcome, uh, Yuki. And uh, a warm welcome uh, to all panelists. Now, the, to, to all the panelists, um, let, let's talk about your lessons the, from the field works and uh, how those lessons can help the policymakers the, to facilitate and uh, um, to harness uh, entrepreneurial uh, resilience uh, for a greater overall economic uh, resilience. Um, by the way, the, to all the audiences, the, the, please the, feel free to uh, type up your questions in the Q&A of the Zoom box, and uh, we will try to address your um, questions uh, as many as we can. Now, um, let me start um, um, first um, by bringing in uh, uh, Professor Habaradas. Um, Professor Habaradas, um, uh, you, you, you've been following the social entrepreneurship in Asia. Um, particularly uh, in the Philippines. Um, can, can, can you tell us a bit uh, more about it? Um, um, uh, man, many entrepreneurs uh, have, have taken on uh, social initiatives um, uh, during the COVID-19 crisis. How, how does the social mission uh, in, influence the, their, their businesses? Um, uh, Professor Baradas, please. Yes, uh, thank you, Yotin, for your question. So how uh, the social mission influences business decisions will really depend on whether the, the firm is primarily profit oriented or if it's uh, primarily concerned about its social mission. So for businesses that were formed social enterprises, the social mission is embedded in their business model. Therefore, social entrepreneurs always take into account their social purpose, sometimes even over their uh, profit orientation. So an example of this business is uh, the Murang Gulai Shop or the Affordable Vegetables Shop, which is an online vegetable trader and retailer based in the Philippines. It buys uh, various agricultural produce at fair prices from farmers in nearby provinces and sells these to Metro Manila buyers at lower than or equal to ongoing market prices. During the pandemic, there was a spike in demand for fruits and vegetables in the Metro. But instead of raising their prices to maximize uh, its profit, uh, the Murang Gulai shop stuck to its business model of offering affordable fruits and vegetables to consumers. And it even worked closely with farmers groups to ensure that it has a stable supply of fruits and vegetables for its business so that it can continue to provide cheap uh, fruits and vegetables to its uh, market. Now for other businesses that were not set up as social enterprises, their social initiatives were either driven by altruism or by a sense of solidarity with their employees. So one example is uh, basic movement a fashion business that actively participated in fundraising activities. Its owner allocated 5% of its uh, revenues for a small fund that it set up. At the height of the pandemic, the business donated to fundraisers for buying alcohol and medical supplies for healthcare and frontline workers. I think many of uh, small entrepreneurs in the Philippines would follow this particular route of altruism. Now, another example is uh, Sunnyside Group, which operates several dining restaurants in Boracay, a famous tourist spot in the Philippines. When the lockdown was imposed, tourism was adversely affected. The Sunnyside Group had to temporarily close because local demand was not big enough to keep uh, their restaurants viable. The owners provided financial support for their employees in the meantime but could not continue subsidizing them when the travel ban was extended indefinitely for several months. So what eventually happened was, uh, was they relocated their restaurant crew from Boracay to Manila and opened up pop-ups uh, of the Sunnyside Cafe to keep their staff employed. So the business uh, also covered the cost of its employees' food tickets, 
and swab tests in the rent of an apartment close to its stores in, in Manila. So uh, these examples show us, that, show us that businesses have different motivations for doing good in times of crisis. Some express their social responsibility in the form of philanthropy, while others do this because it is integral to their business, uh, to their business models. Thank you, Yoti. Thanks, Professor Habaradasta. Thanks for many um, positive examples. And, and, and we need this uh, positive example um, um, coming out from, from the, the pandemic crisis, right? Um, um, so um, maybe let's, let's, let's make, let us move uh, on um, to one important issue um, about uh, uh, the resilience of uh, the entrepreneurs. Um, so we, we just uh, asked uh, Professor Habaradasta about um, how the entrepreneurs taking on the social mission. But um, let's, let's look at the, the entrepreneurs themselves. Um, um, uh, Professor um, Idogo, um, I, I hope that uh, for, for this topic, um, uh, I, I can bring you in next. Um, so um, the, the issue is the following. Um, uh, during the COVID-19 crisis, we know that uh, at the personal level, um, entrepreneur faces the uh, a lot of uh, stress. Um, um, can can you share with us the uh, uh, your 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 lessons about the stress uh, faced by the entrepreneurs uh, during the pandemic crisis? Um, so do, during the crisis, the um, entrepreneur um, went went through um, significant stress, um, uh, financial uh, for sure, um, uh, social um, in in balancing their family, um, company, and their own mental health, um, what implications do you think um, that uh, such stress uh, um, have on, on the businesses of, of the entrepreneurs? Uh, say, Ido, go, please. Thank you, Yutin. Um, for our entrepreneurs, at least based on the data, we see that stress had an impact on their mental health and well-being. And this, of course, translated or consequently has an impact on the business as well. Um, so entrepreneurs tend to see, if we think about entrepreneurship from an identity perspective, they tend to see the business as an extension of themselves. Um, and some entrepreneurs sometimes make comments or they make statements such as, if I'm not doing well, the business is not doing well, because they are basically the business itself. Um, and not only did this, um, the mental health, did it impact on their mental health and well-being, the other aspect or source of stress for the entrepreneurs was to do with their families. So other um, sources of stress included perhaps losing family members during the COVID. So I had one participant, she, I think she had lost over 10 family members to the COVID-19. And that had impacted on her significantly. And on top of that, the lockdown, and she lives on her own. So even that challenge of, of loneliness, of being alone, working on the business, that sort of impacted on um, the business. The other thing that I also found interesting was engagement in entrepreneurship. So for some of them, the stress some of them that were significantly negatively impacted by the crisis, that also then had an impact on whether they would continue to engage in entrepreneurship. So for some, they comp some people withdrew temporarily and came back um, and they took that time to rest or to recoup. Some people withdrew completely and stopped. They shut down the business and they completely stopped doing any form of entrepreneurship. And when I probed, what are you doing? Because it was, it, we, we had different checkpoints. When I go back and say, what's happening now? I, they just say, I'm still thinking, I'm still processing. So it did have a significant effect on them mentally that translated into impacting on the performance or on the business itself. Uh, thank you, um, Dr. Idogo. That's, that's the, those, those lessons are profounding and uh, it's, it's very important for, for us to know what was going on at the personal level to the entrepreneurs. And uh, I, I hope we, we, we come back to that, uh, 
that issue again um, in, in this panel discussion. Um, but um, I, I hope that we can now the, look, look at another um, uh, dimension of uh, entrepreneurship uh, during the COVID-19 crisis. Um, and here, um, um, I, I'd like to bring in the, uh, Ms. Ms. Yuan. Um, um, uh, Ms. Yuan, um, you, you have uh, quite extensive experience um, talking and interacting to the um, entrepreneurs the, during the crisis um, in China and, and elsewhere. Um, have, have you observed uh, any evidence that uh, some group of uh, entrepreneurs are more proactive than, than others in uh, responding to the COVID-19 crisis? Um, Ms. Yuan? Yes. Thank you, Yosin, for the question. Uh, before answering that, um, I'd like to firstly explain what do we mean when we say a firm is proactive. So just like individuals, these proactive organizations, they undertake dynamic uh, short targeting and future-oriented action that aim to improve the business processes and outcomes by actively exploring, experimenting, and validating new opportunities. And in contrast, the more reactive ones, um, they undertake um, more static, defensive, and present focus adjustments that aim only to maintain or return to its pre-crisis status. So in our project collaborated with the ADB, we identified a set of factors that actually stimulate organizational proactivity. So these factors include uh, contextual ones, such as safeguarding policy environment, uh, active industry and community engagement, and open culture that encourage knowledge sharing and tolerant failures, as well as increased social orientation. And also from the firm's perspective, found resource provision provides uh, important buffers for entrepreneurial firms to survive the media shocks during the COVID. Um, firms that are more proactive often have contingency contentious funds that pay for short-term expenses when their revenue decreases dramatically and the policy supports are not yet in place. This bought them valuable time to make sense of the crisis and develop plans to adapt as well as to search for new opportunities. And another finding I thought was really interesting is we found that firms were hit harder by the COVID and engaged in collective sense-making and solution-seeking activities. Actually, they became more proactive at a later stage. Because the shock was too strong for them and they are very desperate, both the entrepreneurs and their employees started to voice out their hidden feelings and thoughts that they do not normally share uh, during normal times. This encouraged open ideation and discussions about possible um, proposals and responses to the crisis, including the ones that may previously be considered too bold or too blue sky. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Yu, and uh, it's, it's uh, good to hear that uh, some uh, entrepreneurs, they are responding faster and, and bouncing back uh, faster. And I think this is uh, somewhat consistent with um, uh, what uh, Professor Alteo mentioned earlier, that uh, um, uh, some entrepreneurs can come back um, and build um, bigger and, and better, right? Um, uh, with, with that, um, maybe I can bring the uh, Professor Alteo back um, and um, so keep, Given what we discussed so far, right? Um, I would like to have uh, your view, uh, Professor Altio. Um, so, if 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 we look ahead, um, and um, I think uh, uh, you 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 mentioned um, about uh, the notion of uh, uh, bap baptism by fire, right? Um, and and that notion is is a striking one, baptism by by fire. Um, can can we ask them? Um, how, how my entrepreneurs experience of uh, bouncing back um, and uh, Ms. Yuan mentioned uh, some of those um, uh, from the COVID-19, um, help, help them cope with uh, um, similar types of uh, crisis um, in the future, if, if, if any. Um, your, your conceptual framework uh, captures many uh, critical elements of, uh, of the resilience. Um, is, is, is there a hope that uh, uh, a next um, Baptism by, by fire, if, if any crisis ever happens again, um, uh, be, become less burning um, than, than this uh, latest one um, of the past two years. Um, Professor Altio, um, any thoughts uh, on this? Thank you. That's a very interesting question. Um, 
we indeed we saw that for some entrepreneurs or for many entrepreneurs you you, you do see this baptism by fire type reaction where the crisis actually makes you stronger and and so it's kind of a strong medicine so some businesses exited but those that managed to adapt and survive they develop this adaptive capability they develop a uh, and this effect operates through many mechanisms but one as i mentioned many entrepreneurs had to adopt digital technologies uh, and and rethink their service delivery and what their service or product concept actually was so there was a lot of such experimentation going on but this experimentation not only enabled the entrepreneurs to adjust but it also enabled many entrepreneurs to discover new opportunities and markets and market needs that they hadn't been addressing before so it's this kind of a positive adjustment experience that then almost becomes an organizational capability itself. And, and we see entrepreneurs who survive the crisis become more confident in themselves. They have been through a difficult crisis and they have survived by adapting and adjusting. And this is perhaps the um, capability and it could be called the dynamic capability that the crisis can uh, help such firms develop. And, and this is something that will help them um, also survive future crises. And one interesting aspect of digitalization of the business model is that digital resources and infrastructures, they are inherently scalable. And that means that the ability of many entrepreneurs to grow their businesses because they have taken on uh, adaptive digital technologies will also be enhanced. And maybe they can now address more distant markets and, and they can more easily scale their offerings to do that. So there are many such baptism by buyer mechanisms going on there. Thank you, Professor Aldo. Um, I hope that we can come back to that um, um, uh, later, um, but uh, those you mentioned, uh, including the concept of uh, dynamic capability, that's 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 so interesting. Um, now, um, let us um, look look at the the question from uh, the floor. Um, I think we have several questions uh, coming in. Um, um, I think one one question could be addressed by um, by any of the panelists. Um, um, uh, the question is uh, is about um, comparing uh, between Asia and and in the UK. So um, for 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 all the panelists, uh, you you have seen hundreds of cases uh, in many economies, right? Um, in Asia and also in in the United Kingdom, um, is there any striking difference uh, between the um, uh, entrepreneurial resilience uh, between those in Asia and um, those in the UK, or or any striking the uh, commonality um, between the two, the two region. Um, any, any panelists want, want to um, uh, take on this question? Um, maybe uh, Anja? To, to, uh, um, so in terms, of, in terms of striking differences or commonalities, we saw a lot of, there were a lot of similarities across the different sites. Um, for example, in terms of experimentation, in terms of pivoting, um, seeing the crisis as an opportunity um, rather than a, a threat. So sometimes you see the entrepreneurs reframe the situation not as a threat, but as a challenge, as an opportunity. Um, mm -hmm. And so they innovate as a result of that. In terms of differences, I might ask one of my other colleagues to share a little bit on the differences. Anyone want to the, speak to the differences? Uh, or we can come back to that uh, 
um, again um, on, on the differences. But I think that this one question that related to um, these the potential differences. Uh, Ergo? Um, yeah, Yotin, if I may. Um, personally, I didn't observe any striking differences between entrepreneurs in different countries. So what was striking was how similar the reactions tended to be. What changes and what is different is the context. Uh, for example, in the UK, um, financial support was more readily available for entrepreneurs and therefore entre some entrepreneurs yeah. were able to use that. So that was kind of an environmental resource provision type thing. Um, some cultural aspects, and for example, in China, entrepreneurs usually do not help one another. Um, it's more like dog eat dog type competition where you know everyone competes against everyone. But during the crisis, we saw entrepreneurs change that attitude and we saw the entrepreneurs starting to give free advice to one another and help one another survive the crisis. And that was kind of an interesting finding within that particular context. So you have those kinds of contextual differences that then um, maybe give rise to differences in behaviors. Thanks, uh, thanks, uh, Urko and uh, Onja on the differences and and uh, the commonality. Um, in fact, uh, the following question I think you already answer. Um, uh, the question asks about what is the most important factor influencing um, the resilience uh, in in Asia. Um, and you already mentioned about the culture, the government support, and the market environment. Um, so let's let's look at uh, uh, another question from the floor. Um, uh, uh, this one is the, uh, being directed uh, uh, at the, uh, Professor uh, Artio. Um, the question asks them: um, did, did the survey um, only sample entrepreneurs that survived the crisis? And if so, um, wouldn't this overstate entrepreneurial resilience? Um, presumably, a, a large number of entrepreneurs uh, did not survive the pandemic and had to lay off their workers. Uh, so I think it's about this, uh, the sample, yes. um, Professor Artur. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think um, this is correct. So we started, obviously, we started with businesses that were alive in the beginning of our study. Um, but it's important to recognize that we are not trying to predict survival in this study. So this is not about a study where, you know, does variation in the level of entrepreneurial resilience affect the chances of survival in a given population of entrepreneurs. What we try to understand is the mechanisms and processes of resilience. Mm -hmm. And we try to understand why some entrepreneurs tend to be more proactive, whereas others are like a uh, rabbit left in, in headlights that they kind of uh, are unable to adopt a positive uh, proactive attitude. Um, what we saw obviously was some entrepreneurs actually exiting our panel um, during the pandemics. And we also saw new entrepreneurs, people starting businesses during the crisis. And we actually included a few what we called COVID baby, COVID babies. Businesses started during the crisis to understand a little bit better what prompted those individuals to start the new business during the crisis. But our focus was on understanding processes and mechanisms rather than predicting survival. Thank you, Ergo. Um, just now you mentioned about uh, uh, some entrepreneurs being more proactive. And uh, I think earlier uh, we, we, we asked uh, uh, Yuki about uh, the, the proactive uh, of uh, the proactivity of some entrepreneurs. Um, um, Maybe the, you did. The, do you want to expand a bit um, on, on your earlier point? Um, say, um, if uh, to, to go back to your observation on uh, some entrepreneurs are more active, proactive than than others during the crisis. Um, how how do the proactive responses play out? Um, 
do, do you have any examples of uh, um, uh, outcomes uh, that, that you find most interesting uh, among others uh, concerning the, the proactivity? You can Thank you, Sing. Thank you, Ajo. Um, well, the question essentially asks um, why being proactive is important to entrepreneurs. So our study suggests that proactivity helps these entrep entrepreneurial firms not only to survive during the crisis, but also adapt to the evolving new normal through the dynamic uh, experimentation innovation. Uh, for instance, we found leaders of proactive businesses envisioned beyond the present waves of crisis and opportunities. They prioritize actions that help their business to perform better also in the post-COVID environment. Um, one example would be a Shanghai-based recruiting company and they transformed into a platform and an online community that supports digital normand and freelancers working remotely from all around the world. And that was why we identify productivity as a resilience generating process that leads to learning uh, capacity enhancement of entrepreneurs and finding a new fit between the market demand and the firm capabilities and taken together help boosting economic resilience at a higher level. Yeah. Thanks, Yuki. Thanks, Tam. Um, I may I yes. add to yeah. what uh, Yuki did? Raymond, please. Um, I think uh, what you wanted to know is what might have uh, contributed to uh, proactiveness of some entrepreneurs uh, as opposed to others. I'll just give you an example. Um, I think a very critical factor, although not necessarily the only one, would be the background of the entrepreneur. Uh, is this entrepreneur a serial entrepreneur? Did he come uh, from a, let's say from industry? Did he have extensive experience uh, in business and entrepreneurship before? So one example will be a Ray Lugtu who owns, uh, who together with his wife owned an online, a consulting firm on digital transformation. So before the pandemic, they were offering training and education face-to-face -face, into different companies, but uh, because of the pandemic, they could not do it face-to-face -face anymore. But because of his extensive experience in, um, in big firms in the country, he has uh, developed a very wide network. He knew a lot about digital transformation, obviously, and um, because of this wide knowledge, experience, and network, he was able to uh, pivot very quickly because that was a part of his nature as an individual. Another one would be the owner of a passion business named a Basic Movement, who had also a wide network of, uh, of people, suppliers, etc., who worked with her in the passion business because she needed support from other creatives. So when the pandemic hit, they, they were able to work together because they were already working together before. They had a very strong entrepreneurial ecosystem in place that allowed them to uh, help each other even in, very, in a very tight uh, situation. So I think uh, the background of the entrepreneur and his knowledge uh, plays a critical role in, uh, in proactivity. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Raymond. That's, that's entirely relevant. And, um, if, if I may press on that point a bit about uh, the proactivity of, of entrepreneurs, and this is the, um, uh, drawn from the, um, the question uh, that, that we got in the Q&A, um, with the following twist um, on, on the proactive on, of entrepreneurs. Um, um, did, did you find evidence of uh, business um, uh, who try to uh, pivot um, and try new things, but fail? So they are, they are proactive, right? They try things, but they fail. Um, do you see that uh, a lot in, in, in your few studies? Um, Onya, maybe you want to jump in? Yeah, so I had a case where the entrepreneur had, she was very proactive. I actually even have her under the category of proactive, but suffer because we have these polar outcomes in the study. Um, she did everything. She adapted as much as she could. However, she the business, this was not something to do with her as an entrepreneur because she is a serial entrepreneur and very experienced. 
um, it was not to do with the idea, the business itself. The, it was more to do with the environment. So outside of, on top of COVID, on top of Bre with Brexit, so this is the UK um, cases. So COVID plus Brexit plus industry turmoil. So her business is within the oil and gas industry. Now funding, and they were expecting funding, and this is early period, March, 2020, when the pandemic first hit. So many um, investors are no longer funding high risk, early stage businesses. They're pulling out immediately. So their survival was, was critically, it was dependent on getting that funding. And she did everything with the board, with her team. She did everything she could. Mm -hmm. They just couldn't make it work. And at that time in 2020, remember there was a lot of, there were a lot of challenges and turmoil within mm -hmm. the oil and gas industry. And there's a shift to clean technology. So investors are no longer wanting to be associated with um, fossil fuels. Instead, they want to be linked to cleaner energy. So those factors combined made it really difficult for her and she had to actually shut down the business. Thanks, thanks, Anja. So it, it, it highlights the importance of the interaction between the, the profile of the entrepreneurs and the context that uh, uh, she is uh, operating in. Um, then um, if, if I may press on that, that point about the profile, um, Anja and the panelists, um, we, we got a question from the Q&A um, asking about this um, gender dimension. Um, the question asked um, whether um, do you observe uh, any uh, difference when it comes to um, the resilience and the support uh, needed by women um, and, uh, and male and entrepreneurs? Um, because the, uh, this, this can help us to um, uh, understand and craft a more gender responsive support uh, to, to entrepreneurs. Um, uh, maybe I, I can turn to the uh, Yuki, please. Uh, you thank you. Thank you, Yuseng. Yeah. Um, so thank you for the question. Uh, we were actually really conscious about gender differences among the entrepreneurs and how that affects their responses to the COVID. About half of our samples are female entrepreneurs. And in our interviews, we asked them to elaborate uh, their experiences as a female entrepreneur in Asia. And first, some of the female entrepreneurs, they believe they are more resilient than their male uh, partners because uh, women are used to dealing with pain and this enabled them to bounce back quickly when encountered uh, encountering setbacks and second the female entrepreneurs especially in Asia they're really good at multitasking many of them are already balancing between families and ventures before the COVID so when the COVID hit and everyone was struggling with work family balance during uh, the crisis, it hasn't been a really big issue uh, for female entrepreneurs. And finally, digitalization accelerated by the COVID-19 actually works more in favor of the female entrepreneurs um, to overcome their gender bias, for example. Uh, one participant actually told us that it has been easier for her to ask for VC investment and establish partnerships when everyone is communicating online and people are less conscious uh, of her gender roles. So yeah, overall, I do believe gender has implications on uh, resilience, especially Thank, in the context thanks, of Yuki. entrepreneurship. Yes, uh, I think that Anya, you wanna jump, jump in, right? Please. Yes, I just wanted to add from at least the UK sample, um, what Yuki mentioned is correct, but something else that I found in the UK sample is the, the women, their, their role as caretakers somehow clashed with the role as entrepreneur as well and the need to be resilient in that sphere. So for example, one entrepreneur, she said she's raising self-sufficient children to, so the children, she had to explain to them that they have to begin to take care of themselves and raise themselves basically because she needed to focus on the business. So there's some of, this could be perhaps an example of some of the differences between the, the countries, one. And the other thing to speak to the second part of the question, which is how um, support could be provided for women. It, 
women entrepreneurs, they basically have that role as the main caretaker. They do require support in that area um, and how that would be provided there, there are different ways that that could look like. Thanks, Sonia. I think that 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 example and, and your points uh, would, would resonate with uh, what the entrepreneurs, female entrepreneurs in Asia uh, 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 are facing. Um, I think that's that's an really important point. Um, let's, let us turn to the Another question from the Q&A, and um, I think this one uh, is directed uh, to the Professor Altio. Um, and I think this, this one, I think Professor Habaradas can also address as well. Um, the question asks them, um, do, do you think the, the state of social infrastructure support, things like in, internet access, the internet speed, and um, the geographic differences of, of the five uh, countries covered in, in your study uh, could potentially impact the, the resilience of uh, the entrepreneurs. Um, and any thought on this, um, Ergo or, or um, Raymond, please? Thank you. Um, this is something we still need to look at. So we haven't conducted that many country comparisons as yet. And obviously our sample is limited to those 50 plus businesses that we shadowed. Um, at the general level, given how important we saw digital resources mm -hmm. and enabling resilient responses because they are inherently more flexible and easier to reallocate to alternative uses than would be say physical machinery mm. or you know restaurant space or something like that. So at the general level, I would expect greater access to digital resources and easier access to digital resources to be an important resilience enabler at the general level. And I would again also at the system level. So I would point back to the um, Thai healthcare provision case. Um, whether um, a country, landlocked country, a country being landlocked or whether it being an island affects resilience outcomes, that I do not know really. Um, we, we have to remember that a confusing element in the case of UK is also Brexit where <laughs> UK somehow mm -hmm. isolates itself from the uh, EU market by, by its own volition, but uh, yeah. that's a different story. Yeah, Th thanks, Erko. Um, on the digital technology, just now the UK mentioned about how the digital technology can uh, close the, the gap uh, on, on, on gender uh, dimension. Um, if, if, if you look at in, in Asia, um, and I hope that here we can bring in the Raymond, um, um, on the role of the digital technologies, uh, Raymond, um, in, in Asia, um, man, many entrepreneurs uh, have, have adopted uh, digital technologies uh, to cope with uh, the pandemic crisis. Um, uh, in, in your view, um, does the digitalization uh, during the COVID-19 uh, really make entrepreneurs um, better placed uh, uh, to, to recover in, in the post-COVID uh, business environment? Yes, sir. Thank you for that question, Jotin. But I wanted to add something to what Erko mentioned earlier. I just want to uh, cite a case. Uh, we have a business found in the, in the province that sold uh, fish baits. And they did not have very strong um, internet connection. They did not have that kind of digital infrastructure that supported digitalization. But uh, the, the business was able to continue because the business model did not require the uh, extensive digital technology. And I just wanted to point out that usually businesses would uh, develop products and services that are fit for their local context. So if they don't have uh, infrastructure there, they would come up with an idea what would fit okay, the market, even if it's in a far-flung area. Now, going back to your question, uh, I think that the ability of the firm to recover after a crisis situation or even to, um, uh, to grow in the face of adversity depends on its ability to assemble its different resources uh, effectively 
and even creatively to respond to changes in the business environment. So it's not, not all about uh, digital technology. As we know, digital technology is just one of the different resources okay, that uh, entrepreneurs can, can tap. And there are other resources like people, machines, uh, uh, equipment, etc. So uh, in short, digital technology will only benefit the business mm-hmm. if it plays an integral role in its business model. So for example, does it allow the business to expand its uh, market reach? Does it, uh, does it enable the business to, uh, to effectively manage its inventory? Does it facilitate collaboration among its employees if that is a critical element of the business? So digitalization for the sake of digitalization does not work. Uh, the digitalization that contributes to the business's uh, a strategic purpose does. So it must mm. be digitalization with a purpose. Okay, all right. That's, that's a very good point, Raymond. Uh, th- thanks very much. Um, I hope that we can go back uh, to this point, um, although uh, we have to do it uh, really quickly on, on the stress. Um, uh, I think the one, one remark that uh, Anya quoted, um, uh, you, you said that uh, one entrepreneur told you that um, if, if I'm not doing well, then the business is not doing well, right? Um, um, so this is important in, in the context of uh, the overall resilience for, for entrepreneurs. Um, if, if, if you go back to these issues of entrepreneurs and uh, the COVID stress, um, um, can, can, can you think of any policy support uh, for entrepreneurs to, to, to cope uh, so, so that they cope better at, at the personal level um, when it comes to the, the broad-based crisis the, such as the COVID-19? the policy support uh, uh, on yeah, the Thank you, Eugene. Um, so one of the things that I highlighted is that in our study, um, the heightened uncertainty that was created by the, the crisis and, the, and therefore the inability to plan was also a source of stress for the entrepreneurs. So what policymakers could do or how they could potentially support these SMEs is by providing timely information for them because then they they need to actually take action. They don't know if we're in lockdown or if we're not in lockdown. Um, And it was just such a, it was sort of like operating in the dark, if you you like. Um, So that information is critical. The other thing is that they also need funding. Um, Most of them, when I ask this question, what kind of support do you need? It all went back to funding and that funding for example one entrepreneur mentioned in the UK at least when they released the bounce back loan that entrepreneurs could apply for that gave them some sort of rest or if you like it calmed them down and that allowed them to con- to progress to continue to work on developing the technology or whatever it is that the entrepreneur was working on so for that those two elements I think are critical thank you Thanks, Anja. Thank, thanks for that insight. Um, I think um, we have uh, many uh, uh, comments and questions that, that we, we couldn't address uh, in this webinar, um, five to six of them. Um, I, I'm, I'm sorry about that. Um, um, this is the top of the hour already. Um, so um, uh, I, I hope that uh, whether you are policymakers, uh, researchers uh, from universities, think tanks, uh, or members of uh, international um, community um, or, or anyone with interest uh, in, in this topic. Um, uh, we, we have learned together many insights from uh, our speaker and uh, distinguished uh, panels. Um, uh, these are interesting lessons um, about the uh, determinants of uh, entrepreneurial uh, resilience uh, during the crisis, um, the role they play in the overall the economic resilience and uh, uh, what policymakers uh, can do to help entrepreneurs um, withstand uh, this type of large uh, economic crisis. So um, thanks very much, uh, Professor Ergo Altio, um, Dr. Onya uh, Idogo, uh, Professor Raymond Habaradas, and uh, Ms. Yuki Yuan uh, for sharing your knowledge and uh, experiences uh, today. Um, uh, we hope uh, you come back and join us again um, uh, in the future. Um, now, Come, coming up next um, in the Asian Impact uh, is on uh, May 26th uh, at uh, 10 a.m. Uh, Manila time. Uh, the topic is on the building resilience uh, with uh, social protection. 
in the time of crisis. Uh, thank you for joining us today and uh, hope to see you again. Goodbye.